Hello class, in this video I'll be discussing about batteries, the different types of batteries and how they work. Batteries are found in every household and supply energy to many portable devices including your phone, watch and remote controls. Batteries are made up of a series of electrochemical cells which harness the spontaneous redox reaction to convert chemical energy into electrical energy. We can classify cells and batteries into two main types, primary cells and secondary cells. Primary cells are defined as non-rechargeable cells and are to be disposed of once the battery is dead. The reason for this is because the redox reaction occurring in the galvanic cell is not reversible which means there is no way for you to regenerate the reactants again. An example of a primary cell would be the battery commonly found inside of a watch. On the other hand, secondary cells are defined as rechargeable cells and can be discharged and reused multiple times. This is because the redox reactions inside of a secondary cell can be reversed which means you have the capacity to regenerate and restore your starting materials again. An example of a secondary cell would be the battery found inside of a mobile phone. Let's now look at primary cells in more detail. As I've stated earlier, primary cells are non-rechargeable cells and are designed to be small, portable and cheap to power small electrical devices. They are to be used up and discarded once the battery is dead and this is illustrated in the animation where you can see that the reactants are gradually consumed until the battery is flat. In order for the primary cell to be functional, it needs to be engineered and developed to convert chemical energy into electrical energy instead of thermal energy. This is achieved by separating the cathode and anode and lastly, we need to have a material that acts as a barrier between the site of oxidation and reduction. This prevents the reactants from mixing directly and giving off thermal energy instead. Unfortunately, primary cells are specifically designed to not be recharged and there are two reasons for this. Firstly, the products formed from the redox reaction migrate away from the electrode. In order for the reverse reaction to occur, the products must remain in close proximity as the site of oxidation and reduction occurs on the surface of the electrode. Secondly, the products might be consumed by side reactions occurring in a cell and are thus not present for the reverse reaction to occur. As a result, it is not possible to regenerate the reactants. There are three main types of primary cells that I would like to discuss about in this video. You won't need to know the specific details about the chemical reactions occurring at the anode and cathode for each cell. Instead, I would like you to be aware of the general design features and characteristics. Let's first discuss about the dry cell. Dry cells are small batteries often used in torches and toys. Since it is a galvanic cell, the battery will be dead once the reactants around the electrodes have been consumed. Inside of a dry cell, there is an electrolyte paste as you can see on the diagram. Please note the position of the electrolyte paste. It is found in between the sites of oxidation and reduction to prevent the contacts from mixing to avoid a direct redox reaction. Alkaline cells are the batteries we commonly use and find in the supermarkets. They are better compared to dry cells because they provide more electrical current and have a longer shelf life. The reason why they are better is because they contain less electrolytes which means it can hold more reactants inside of a battery to take part of the reaction. Unlike a dry cell which contains a dry paste, an alkaline cell has a separator which is a thin material that prevents the mixing of the anode and cathode components. And the final type of primary cell that I would like to talk about is the button cell. These batteries are typically found in small devices like calculators, hearing aids, pacemakers and in these devices, replacing the battery regularly would be undesirable so they are designed to have a longer battery life compared to dry cells and alkaline cells. Similarly to a dry cell, it also contains a thick paste to prevent the direct redox reaction between the reactants to avoid and minimise thermal energy being produced. Using your pre-existing understanding of galvanic cells and what we discussed, have a go and see if you can answer the following question. Given the chemical equation, identify the type of electrode zinc metal is and whether it undergoes oxidation or reduction. To answer this question, we should compare the oxidation numbers of zinc in the reactants and products. We can see that the oxidation of zinc metal is zero and the oxidation of zinc in the salt is positive too. Increasing the oxidation number indicates that zinc is oxidized and we know that oxidation occurs at the anode in a galvanic cell when the battery is discharging. Hence, the best answer is going to be D since we know that the anode is negatively charged. In the second half of this video, I will now discuss what are secondary cells. Secondary cells are also known as accumulators, are cells that can be discharged and recharged numerous times. Secondary cells behave in the same way as a primary cell when it's discharging, where electrons flow from the negatively charged anode to the positively charged cathode. 
However, when the reactants have been used up, we can regenerate or recharge the battery by supplying electrical energy from an external source like a charger or a power outlet. As shown in the diagram, the direction of the electron flow is reversed when we're recharging the battery, which means instead of moving from the negative to positive terminal, electrons are now moving from the positive to negative terminal. The secondary cell has a capacity to regenerate reactants because the products that are formed during discharge remains in close contact with the electrodes. This is important because redox reactions occur on the surface of the electrodes. Hence, it is important for the species to be in close proximity for the reverse reaction to occur. Furthermore, the backwards reaction is favoured when a charger is connected in the circuit because the potential difference of the charger is greater than the potential difference of the cell. I would like to add that the voltage supplied by the charger needs to be greater than the potential difference of the cell, otherwise the cell will not recharge. Let's examine a secondary cell when it discharges and recharges in more detail. When we are converting chemical energy into electrical energy, we know that oxidation occurs at the anode and the reduction occurs at the cathode and the electrons always flows from the anode to cathode. From our previous knowledge, we also know the anode is negatively charged because electrons are generated at the anode, whereas the cathode is positively charged because electrons get consumed. Furthermore, we also know that the anode gets consumed as the reaction progresses and metals deposit on the cathode. This process will continue to occur until all the reactants have been consumed and becomes flat and is thus unable to power the lamp as shown in the diagram. However, when we are recharging the cell or battery, we need to connect the positive terminal of the charger to the positive electrode and the negative terminal of the charger to the negative electrode. In doing so, the charger supplies the battery electricity which reverses the direction of the electron flow. Hence, the electrons will move from the positively charged electrode to the negatively charged electrode as shown in the diagram over here. Please note that in this process, since the positive electrode is now losing electrons, this is now the site of oxidation which by definition is now the anode. Hence, the cathode becomes the anode when the secondary cell is recharging. However, please bear in mind that this anode is positively charged. In contrast, since electrode Y is gaining electrons during the recharging process, it now becomes the site of reduction and is thus the cathode. The polarity of the cathode when it recharges is negative. I will now explain these processes again using a different illustration hoping that multiple exposures may help with your understanding. When the secondary cell acts as a galvanic cell, the cathode is the positively charged electrode and the anode is the negatively charged electrode. When it discharges, electrons flow from the negatively charged anode to positively charged cathode as you can see over here. However, when the cell recharges, the direction of electron flow is reversed which means electrons move from the positive to negative electrode. Since electrons are now being lost at the positive electrode, this electrode is now the anode since oxidation, which is the loss of electrons, occurs at the anode and the negative charged electrode is now the cathode because it gains electrons. It is crucial for you to understand where is the site of oxidation reduction and the polarity of the anode and cathode when the secondary cell discharges and recharges. All of this is neatly summarised in the slide over here. I would like to mention that when the cell discharges, it acts as a galvanic cell, but when the cell recharges, it acts as an electrolytic cell, which is a new term that you haven't learnt yet, but this will be extensively talked about in another video. The next slide summarises the differences between primary cells and secondary cells. Because this is a content heavy topic, there are many misconceptions that students often have related to primary cells and secondary cells. Firstly, students often believe that the polarity of the anode is always negative and the polarity of the cathode is positive when the cell is both discharging and recharging. This is incorrect. To aid with your understanding, I would recommend that you refer to the following table. We know that the site of oxidation will always occur at the anode, so therefore we can write the general half equation for oxidation like this where it loses electrons, whereas the cathode is the site of reduction where it gains electrons. The polarity of the anode when it discharges is going to be negative whereas it's going to be positive for the cathode and this is going to be reversed when it's recharging. Another common mistake that students often make is when they're trying to indicate the direction of electron flow when the cell is discharging and recharging. When the secondary cell is discharging, we know that electrons flow from the negative to positive electrode. However, this process is reversed when the cell is recharging, so it moves from the positive to a negative electrode. I would like to emphasize that in both of these processes, 
electrons are always going to be moving from the anode to cathode. To test for your understanding, I would now like you to answer the following question. Is the following statement true or false? This statement reads, in both discharge and recharge, electrons flow from the negative terminal to the positive terminal. We know that this is going to be false because electrons always flows from the anode to cathode when the galvanic cell is both discharging or recharging. When it's recharging, it actually moves from the positive terminal to the negative terminal, so that's why it's false. Which of the following actions will recharge a secondary cell? The correct answer to this question is that we should be connecting the negative terminal of the voltage source to the negative electrode, which in this case is the cathode, and the positive terminal of the voltage source to the positive electrode, which is the anode. Please pause the video and have a go with this question. In this question, we want to identify what is the reaction occurring at the negative electrode as a cell is discharging. We know that the negative electrode when the cell is discharging is the anode, so therefore oxidation takes place. Because oxidation is taking place, we know that electrons are being lost, therefore we can eliminate these two half equations. The next step is for us to compare what is the oxidation numbers. What I'm going to do is I'm going to compare the oxidation number of lead in the reactants and products. This has an oxidation number of zero, whereas in the products, it has an oxidation number of positive two. As a result, therefore, I know that A is going to be the correct answer because lead is being oxidized. By now, you should be able to meet the following success criteria. This is the end of the video. Thank you for watching and I'll see you guys again in the next one. Bye.